it's, it's one thing for the Bible to say it, but the Bible said it for thousands of years. And if we're, in order for us to live it and experience it, we come into agreement with Scripture. We agree, we, we believe what the Bible says about us. Probably the hardest, most challenging thing that you'll do is to believe what the Word says about you. But he, we try every Sunday morning. And uh, so guys, go ahead and, and change that slide. Look at this, what it says up here. Everybody together, ready? I am blessed. I'm blessed going in and blessed going out. I am blessed in the bowl and blessed in the field. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Now say it. Praise God. That's good news. Now before you sit down, look in a 360 degree circle and welcome everyone that's near you today. Will you do that? If you don't know them, turn around and introduce yourself to them. Take a minute and say hello to someone. If you're watching online, I want to thank you for being a part of this service today. Thanks for being with us. If you go to our Facebook page, Open Door Ohio, leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for being a part of this service today. up the screen, this is really the focus that we're going to talk about today. This is the word that is important to us today. Everybody say it together. Ready? Recognition. Recognition. And if you see the word cognitive, you can see the root word in there. The cognitive part of your mind is the part of your mind that you activate in order to understand things. It's the part of your mind that you use in order to see faces, to understand things, to calculate to strategize, to fully comprehend. And so when we talk about recognition or recognizing something, you can look to the screen to find a very simple definition. The act of identifying somebody or something. The act of identifying somebody or something. I think one of the greatest things that we develop in our spiritual journeys that will help us in our families, help us in our marriages, help us in our workplaces, it will literally change the way that you see your circumstances. Because by the way, it is not your circumstances that do you in. It is the reaction to those circumstances that do you in. Uh, they've, been, they've been showing on television, the High State Buckeyes have this bracelet that uh, someone who gave a leadership lecture gave them. And I don't know that I have it exactly correct, but it, it talks about a situation or an event plus my reaction equals outcome. Event plus reaction equals outcome. And a lot of times I think we kind of inadvertently believe that the outcome of my life is because of my circumstances. In other words, the outcome that I live in now is because I went to college or didn't go to college. Because I got married or I didn't get married. Situations beyond my control, how people have treated me, where I was born, the family in which I was born. And many times we just kind of throw up our hands and we really don't take control of our life and let God steer us in a blessing because we've come to the conclusion that my circumstances equals the outcome of my life. And I want to encourage you today that if you live that way or, or that's the way you automatically think, I want to tell you that your whole life will constantly be controlled by outside circumstances. And it's a shame when we let circumstances and events, some of them 20 and 30 years old, still dictating our life today. And so we need to understand that it's not situation equals outcome, it's the situation or the circumstances plus my reaction. Now, let's talk about your reaction for a minute. One of the things that will change your life is when you begin to realize that God is in your circumstances. 
It sometimes takes a great level of faith. It sometimes takes a great level of vision. And honestly, there are times when you want to throw up your hands and you say, I can't find God anywhere in this. Some of us have prayed the prayer, God, where are you? Why did you let this happen? Why did this tragedy befall us? Why have you let us go through this? Why haven't you intervened? Why haven't you changed these circumstances? And I don't think there's a person in this room that hasn't thought that or verbalized that somehow, some way in your life. And that's where faith picks up and that's where we've got to look at the screen and that word again. This is where we've got to have recognition or let me say it this way. That's when we have to recognize God in our circumstances. Because the Bible is clear that God is there. The Bible is clear that God has a plan through every event in your life. The Bible is clear that no matter what you've been through, no matter what tragedies that you're going through today, no matter what reversements, no matter what's going on in your job, no matter what people are saying about you, no matter what people are gossiping about you, no matter what the rumor mill says, it doesn't matter if it looks bleak or you've been through all kinds of reversements physically, emotionally, financially. The Bible is clear that God's there. But honestly, sometimes trying to find God is like trying to find Waldo. I just ruined it for a bunch of you because you're, you're tuned in. You're wanting to find Waldo. I'm going to tell you, Waldo's there. Just so you'll pay attention now. He's right there. Okay. Just, just so I can have your attention back. There he is. There's Waldo. You can kind of see him. It's a little fuzzy, but you, if he's got his signature stripe sweater on, so there's Waldo. And how many people know that sometimes trying to find God in some circumstances is like trying to find Waldo? I mean, really, I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm telling you, when you look at that picture and how the artist draws all of these little characters, there's a couple of things that occur to me. First of all, there's a lot of people in that frame. And what happens to us in life is we have a lot of people telling us what we should do. We have a lot of voices. We have people in our lives like friends and family. And some, somehow everybody feels like they're an expert in your life. And so sometimes advice is good, but honestly, sometimes you need to turn off advice. And then we have voices that aren't personally connected with us, like the television or the cover of a magazine. Or we see someone who seems so, so wonderfully successful and famous and that all communicates something to us and usually what it communicates to us is you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're too big. You're too small. You can't do it. So we have all of these voices like this picture of Waldo but in the middle of all of those voices there is a still small voice. There was a man in the Old Testament. He's a prophet. His name was Elijah. And he went through a great victory. But have you ever noticed in life sometimes following your greatest victories come your greatest defeats? You know, it's like when you get great news and everything looks like it's just going to go perfect, then you get about four things of bad news. Does that ever happen to anybody but me? Well, it happened to Elijah. He had a great victory. Fire came out of heaven. It was miraculous. He proved his point. It looked like everything from that point in time was going to be smooth sailing. Then a woman by the name of Jezebel, who was the wife of the king, put out a warrant for his arrest and for his killing. So he ran into a cave, and it's there in that cave that the Bible says that God spoke to him. But what is interesting is not that God spoke to him, it's how God spoke to him. In the story, three things happened first. There was a great loud wind, there was a great rumbling earthquake, and there was a hot flame of fire. And God didn't speak through any of those things. Because sometimes in our life, it's not the big event that God is going to speak through. What the Bible says, in that cave, Elijah heard, what? A still, small voice. Sometimes God in our circumstances is like trying to find Waldo. It's like trying to hear that still small voice from all of these louder voices. It's like trying to find God when you've got so many people in your face. It's like trying to find the silver lining when all you see are the storm clouds. But I want to tell you again, if you don't get anything else from this message, the key word is recognition. 
what it means to live in faith is we search until we recognize where God is. So back to the screen. There's Waldo. You see him, and the amazing thing is, here's the beautiful part. Now you still see him. You can look away, but instantly you know where Waldo is. And I've had these books, and my kids enjoyed these books, and we looked at them, and here's, here's the bad part about a Waldo book. Once you find him on every page, it gets boring. And the fact is, you can learn to discover God. You can learn to hear his voice. You can hear his voice, and you know what? Some of you hear God's voice, and you don't even know it's God. You may call it a premonition. You may think that's a crazy thought. Have you ever met someone, and instantly it's like you felt like you knew something for them or about them? Maybe it's the checkout counter at a store, and you look at someone, and you just get this overwhelming urge to say to this person, you know what? It's going to be okay. Am I thinking these thoughts? That's absolutely crazy. What many of you don't know is that's been God speaking to you for years. And maybe you've just dismissed it and you thought, you know, that's just me. But this is God. This is God playing a part in your daily life. God is not on the other side of the universe. He's not up there somewhere in space. He's not on the throne only concerned about the, the uh, conduct of nations. God is in your personal life. He's in your bowl of Cheerios in the morning. He's in your cup of coffee. He's in the, the, the news that you watch in the morning on television. He's with you in the morning drive to work. He's there at the assembly line. He's there at your desk. He's there in the classroom. He's speaking to you as people speak to you. He's in the circumstances of your life, the rain, the sunshine. Jesus said birds cannot escape the attention of God. He knows every hair numbered on your head though those numbers are getting smaller for some of us I'm not looking at anybody I'm just talking that's the God we serve it's not a matter of whether God's speaking it really is a matter of our recognition are we able to see God I love this verse it's Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 and 6 look to the screen let your conduct be without two things covetousness and be content with things as you have now just stop right there and look at these two things don't covet don't look at someone else's life look and, and think this and boy isn't this isn't this really a temptation when you're going through a, a, a deep valley isn't it a temptation to look at someone else and say man they don't have any problems look at them the perfect couple look at her so spiritual well, how many people know it's really easy to think that way? When you go through a valley, you look at other people and you think, they, they, they just, they, they're not going through what I'm going through. I want to tell you something. I pastor this bunch. I know most of you, know most of you for many years. I want you to look around. Because there ain't nobody in this room that ain't going through, through some junk right now. There's not a person in this room that has a perfect marriage. There's not a person in this room that doesn't have some doubts and fears sometimes. There's not a person in this room that hasn't lost some sleep because you've worried about your children and grandchildren. There's not a person in this room that hasn't been affected somehow by drug addiction in your family. There's not a person in this room that hasn't scratched their heads and wondered how are we going to pay these bills when they see how much they owe on their credit card or their electric bill. There's not a person in this room that hasn't suffered reversement. There's not a person in this room that hasn't fought off depression. There's not a person in this room that hasn't felt sad and lonely at times. That's why this verse says what it says, because we have got to guard ourselves against covetousness, and then it says be content with such things as you have. That just means what you're going through, understand it right now is part of God's plan for your life no matter how bad no matter how 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 ugly it may even look God has something in store through it now let's finish the verse let your conduct be without covetousness be content with such things as you have for he himself said I will never ever 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 leave you or forsake you I don't care what you've done God didn't leave you you may have had experiences with God and then walked away from fellowship with Him and with the church. And you've been in many places that you don't even like to remember that you went to. Here's the stunning thought. When you went there, so did He. 
God has been with you in your lowest valley. God's been with you in your highest mountain. God's been with you when you thought nobody was there. God guarded you and protected you when you should have died. God was there watching your back when you didn't know anybody was there watching your back. Because he said, I'm never going to leave you and I'm never going to forsake you. When you look at this verse in the old King James, it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We don't use that language anymore, but it's a shame because the word you there is not plural. It is actually a singular tense. And that means when it says you, he's not talking about you all. He literally is like, this Greek word is like literally pointing your finger in someone's face and saying, I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. And what God wants to do is reach through the pages of an ancient document that he inspired 2,000 years ago to be written. And he wants you to see his finger point in your face for just a moment. And not a pointing of judgment, not a pointing out of condemnation, but a pointing out that said, did not say, I would never leave you. And I would never forsake you. How many people know we've left him? And we've forsaken him many times, for many days, maybe for just an hour. Times that we've walked away from God, times that we know we should have done right, but we chose not to do right. Times we should have said a nice thing, but we chose to say a mean, angry thing to our spouse. Times that we know we should have done right, but we did wrong. Times that we knew that was wrong and we did it anyway. We have wandered and forsaken away from God. That's why it's God's grace and mercy that is beautiful today. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. What we think is so wonderful about ourselves, be honest with me, it's not that great. Your wife will tell me. Your kids will tell me. Your husband will tell me. My wife will tell you, my kids will tell you, I'm not so great. You're not so great, none of us are, but I'll tell you who is great. It's our God that says to us, I will never, ever, ever leave you. And I told you, I will never, ever, ever forsake you. He's never left you, he's never forsaken you. But sometimes life gets a little bit like Waldo and you've got to search for him. You've got to recognize God in your circumstances. And here's the thing, the more you do it, the better you get at it you got to try. you got to practice. It's a journey. It's something you develop. It's the ability to look at a bad situation and say, you know what, but I think God's there in there in that situation. It's the ability to look at trouble and say, but you know what, I think God is there in that trouble. It's the ability to look at your marriage and your children, your finances, your health, your job situation, to look at your life and be able to find God there. You say, oh, but Mark, there's so many other things there. Yes, there is. There's critics There's people who don't like you. There's people who will celebrate your failure. There's people who will shake their head and wag their fingers and say, I told you so. There's always going to be a bunch of people around Waldo. But listen, once you learn to find Waldo, you'll always find Waldo. Hello? There he is. So what does it say? Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Let's finish it. So we may boldly say. I love that. He said, so we may say. That's why we do the confession every morning. I'm blessed. I'm blessed going in, blessed going out, blessed bold, blessed in the field, blessed in the city, blessed in the... Why do we say that? He has said it, so we may say it. And there's times, ladies and gentlemen, where you've got to say something. You've got to talk. They say you're crazy if you talk to yourself. Ma'am, I I talk to myself and I answer myself and then I argue with myself. Call me crazy, but I know this. i got to change my language and align it with God's Word. He said, so I'm going to say. He said, I'll never leave Mark Pfeiffer. I'll never forsake Mark Pfeiffer. So what's Mark going to say? I say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. That is not arrogance. That is not pride because it's not based on what I said. It's based on what he said. He said he'll never leave me or forsake me. So if I can recognize him in my circumstances like finding Waldo, if I find God, once I find God, then I can stand up and say, the Lord is my helper. He'll never leave me or forsake me. He's my helper. 
He's here to help you with your troubles. He's here to help you through that situation. He's here to help you through your dark night. He's here to help you through the valley that you're walking through today. He's here to help you through whatever situation, whatever dream that you feel has been dashed, whatever dream you feel has been trampled away, God is here. He will never leave you or forsake you so you can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I will not fear. That's a decision you've got to make in your mind. I will not fear. And you may have to say it out loud. I will not fear. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. And then about 10 minutes later, you're going to be worried about it again. So you say, well, the Lord is my helper. He said, he'd never leave me. Thank you, Jesus. You are with me today, God. You're with me. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me. You are my helper. I will not fear. You begin to speak the word of God. You begin to confess the word of God like that. Listen to me. There is power in those words. I will not fear what can man do to me. What can man do to me? Now, talking about recognition, talking about recognizing God, there are three stories that I want to talk about today. If you look at your notes, you can see the scriptures that are associated with these stories. The first story is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. What is the common thread of all three of these stories is this. This is after Jesus rose from the dead. After he arose from the dead, he appeared to people who recognized him previously but did not recognize him now. There are three stories where Jesus appeared to people and they did not recognize him. And what we want to do is just tell these stories. I just want to tell you three stories today and show you how God can snuggle up against you and you not even know it. To show you how God has never left you or forsaken you. To show you that even when it seems like that God was nowhere around, He may have walked with you and you didn't even know it. That He was there in many ways. The first story, you can see the picture on the screen. You can see it there in your notes. The scripture is from Luke chapter 24. It says this, Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. This first story is a story of two people. We don't know exactly who these disciples were. One of their names is given, but the other one is withheld. They were probably not one of the inner circle of twelve, but they were associated with the twelve. As they walked on the road seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they were discussing the events that had just happened, and that is that Jesus, whom they thought was Messiah, died. And what was their situation? They were confused. Have you ever been confused? Have you ever been in situations in life and you think, I, what is, this is, I don't understand this, God. I don't understand this. These two men were confused because although they weren't part of the inner circle, they were associated with them and knew them. The reason we know that is because they explained to Jesus that there was a woman who came from a tomb saying that he was gone, but they were still confused. Because their idea of who Jesus was as a Messiah was an earthly king and general. They really expected somebody like Julius Caesar. They expected someone like Alexander the Great to be their Messiah. Isn't it amazing how we paint our own pictures of what we think God ought to do and how God ought to do it and what our marriage ought to be and what our life ought to be. And sometimes our marriages and our life, they just don't turn out like we thought. <laughs> oh boy. How many people sitting here today would be honest with me, your life probably isn't exactly how you imagined it when you were 20 years old. But if you're not 20, you'll get there. None of us. Life is not that way. Life doesn't fall into what your dreams and anticipations are. Life becomes what seems like random, but is under the sovereign hand of God. These men did not understand that because they expected Messiah to be a great military leader and to sit upon an earthly throne. Instead, the man Jesus was killed. Not only was he killed, he was humiliated. He was tortured. He was killed as a common criminal. Imagine your preacher being arrested, sentenced to death, and executed publicly. 
The guy that you believed in, the guy that you followed, the guy that you trusted, they were confused. And they're walking together questioning and reasoning and discussing these issues when Jesus comes by and they did not recognize him. Jesus began to ask a few questions and as he asked these questions he said I can't believe that you don't understand these things and then he went to the scripture and it says in Luke that he taught from the scripture in the Old Testament showing them how Christ must suffer and die they finally reached their destination Jesus went inside with them and while he was breaking bread the Bible says he vanished in front of them and when they when they saw him break the bread they recognized him and then they made this statement wasn't our heart strangely warm? I think that's kind of a bizarre reaction. Because you just had Jesus teach you for the last three hours in the Old Testament. And what interests me about this story is what I would have said. Because I would have said, wow, that guy's smart. Man, he really knows theology. Wow, he's got scripture memorized. See, I would have probably been impressed with what intellectually he said to me. But these two disciples didn't even talk about his intellect. What is interesting is what they said that impressed them the most is that our hearts were strangely warmed. And here's what I'm telling some of you. You're confused about your situation. You're trying to figure it out. Don't because the more you try to intellectually figure out some circumstances the more confusing they get there are some times in life where you don't get the answer to why why did my child die why has this happened to me in fact I would say that most things in life that I ask why I can't ever say that I figure out can you accept this today it's not the intellectual answer that's going to help you what's going to help you is that when God comes to you and your heart is strangely warmed you see here's what I'm saying today is that God appears in ways that we don't recognize and sometimes those ways that he appears to us is just simply a feeling a feeling of our hearts being warmed a feeling where God wants to overshadow us and comfort us and often we ruin those moments by asking, why, Lord? Why did this happen? Why did they do that? Why did they say this? What's going on? What's the situation? Show me behind the scenes. And many times God does not, does not explain to us, nor do those answers ever come to us. What God wants to do is come to us in times when our hearts are just strangely warm, where God wants to comfort us supernaturally. And at times we don't recognize that this is God. But there's been times in your life, I don't know where you've been, I don't know what you've done, I don't know your background, I don't know your whole situation, but I would say that there's been times where you've got comfort from a song on the radio. Your heart was strangely worn because you saw a puppy or you read a poem or somebody said something nice or did something nice or you watched a television program and sometimes we think, well, how in the world could that be God? Well, you know, there's a story in the Old Testament where God spoke to a prophet through an artist who was making a bowl. See, God can speak through donkeys. Don't look at me that way. God can speak through donkeys. God can speak through whatever means He wants to speak. And there are times in your life where you need to recognize that it's God that your heart was strangely warm in that time, in that moment. It may not have appeared like God, but I can tell you this, that God is good at disguising Himself. And these two men, they would have known Jesus. They would have seen Him countless times but in that moment they didn't recognize him because he was incognito and what they needed was a warm heart God's been comforting you even when you didn't know it the second story is much like the first one the second story is of Mary Magdalene here's a picture of Mary looking into the tomb and she's weeping why because all that she knows is I came to bring flowers to his grave and he's gone now intellectually again she added two plus two and got five how's that possible because she came to an empty tomb and instead of believing that Jesus was alive and risen as you see him in the background instead of believing that she came to the conclusion that somebody stole his body somebody is a grave robber 
Some perverted individual, some insane individual rolled the stone away, took a dead corpse and stole it. And there she is. The Bible says she looks into the tomb and she begins to weep. If you look at your notes, it's from John chapter 20, verses 11 to 14. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've taken him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and look what it says, and did not know that it was Jesus. So she turns around, her eyes are filled with tears because she's looking in the wrong place. She turns, her heart is full of grief, her eyes are full of tears, and she begins to speak with this gentleman. And she assumes, if you know the story, you know this, she thought he was a what? A gardener. Can you imagine? The risen Son of God. And you take him for the gardener. How did she come to that conclusion? Because her heart was so full of grief. You know, I'm talking to some people that you've come to some wrong conclusions, frankly, because your heart's been full of grief. Your eyes have been full of tears. You've gone through horrible situations, gone through bad situations, and even sometimes we make conclusions about life that can be wrong because we've not recognized Jesus. We've seen the picture, can't find Waldo anywhere. So we assume what? Waldo's not there. Somebody tricked me. Somebody fooled me. Somebody lied to me. That preacher, those Sunday school teachers, those singers, those those teachers, those television evangelists. Somebody lied to me. Somebody didn't tell me the truth. And so we come to conclusions and we could be staring face to face in the very eyes of Messiah and swear that's a gardener. That's not Jesus. That's a gardener. Because we've reached some wrong conclusions. You know, the only source of real truth that you'll ever be able to build your life on is what the Bible says. You can build your life on what society says. You can build your life on what your folks taught you or what your grandparents used to say. You can build your life on what television shows and reality shows teach you. But I'm telling you, it all falls down in sand, like Jesus said. You build your house on the rock and it stands because the Bible tells you about life. It tells you what reality is. It's hard to accept, but sometimes what we've concluded is reality all of our life could be absolutely 100% wrong. And that's when we get challenged, when the Bible says one thing, but we've always believed another. Because my dad used to say, and my mom used to say, and my aunt used to say, and my grandparents used to say. But I can tell you, when your eyes are full of tears and your heart is full of grief, Jesus will be there with you. Because he said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. Therefore, we can say, why am I afraid? What can man do to me? Jesus will come to you in times when your heart is heavy, when you are grieving. And when you read the rest of this story, it's kind of interesting how her eyes were opened. Because as she spoke to Jesus, carrying on this conversation with the man that she supposed to be a gardener, at some point in the conversation, Jesus just does this. He stops and interrupts and says, Mary. And the moment she heard her name, her eyes were opened. You know, the Bible says that God knows your name. You know, the Bible says that God has put his angels on charge over you. You know, the Bible says, as I said, he's got the hairs of your head numbered. Why did Jesus say that? Because Jesus wanted people to know that God cares for the lilies of the field. He has the number of birds numbered on the earth today. God sees every flower in every field that will only live for 24 hours. And that same God has followed you around all your life. You may have assumed he was a gardener. You may have assumed a lot of things, but I can tell you that God is there. He knows your name, and God is speaking some of your names today. God is calling you out by name to give your life to him. He's calling you out by name to get your life right with him. He wants to bless it. He wants to bring you into something new. He wants to bring you into a new level. He wants you to have the greatest life you can possibly live. You've got to recognize the love of God, the tenderness of God. Religion has painted a picture on God that's not accurate because many of us have attended churches and we've heard sermons that literally scared us to death. 
And we had no idea that God had any love. We had no idea that God cared for us at all. God was more like a jailkeeper. He was more like the cop that got a real thrill out of bullying people. That was our God. God that enjoyed just striking people down. God that if he spoke, he was going to yell at you. If he was going to act, he was probably going to condemn you. And so we've run and we've hid from that kind of God. But the God of the Bible is a God of love. It's a God that Jesus is exemplifying here when he looks at Mary who has dishonored him by thinking he's a gardener, but he did not condemn her. He just spoke her name, Mary. You see, God's been with you all of your life and he knows your name. He speaks your name today. He's calling your name. And what he's saying is, will you believe? Will you give your life to me? The third and final picture story is the story of Jesus appearing to his disciples in John chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. It's on your notes. Read it as I do. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon, Peter, and Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee. The two sons of Zebedee and others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Leave it to a man. The the answer to all dilemmas, well, I'm just going to go fishing. What does that represent? Does that represent an escape? Maybe in some ways, but please remember that Peter was a fisherman. It means I'm giving up on this new thing. I'm just going to go back to what I've always done. Peter going back to fishing represents someone who's answered a call of God, gone so far, got discouraged, and said, I'm done. Have you ever been discouraged? Have you ever been disappointed? This is akin to someone who said, I, I, I believe this is going to be good and it's going to work, and, and, and it didn't work, and it didn't turn out. You believed that someone was going to get healed, but they didn't get healed. You believed that it was going to be okay, and it didn't seem to turn out okay. You're discouraged. You're disappointed. You wanted it to work out. It didn't. It failed, and here we are left to pick up the pieces. So some of us are like Peter. Some of us are just like, well, I'm I'm going back. I don't know. I'm just going back to fishing. Fishing represented his comfort zone. Fishing represented what he had always done. Fishing represents what you can do without really being challenged. Fishing represents, I'm just going to go back and you can have all this new stuff. You can believe whatever you're going to believe. But as for me, I'm just going to get back in the boat and I'm going fishing. And a lot of people, when they've been disappointed, they retreat. Maybe some of you have retreated. Maybe one time you were on fire for God and you loved God. You know, it's... People say, well, I still love God. Well, all right, but you know what? If we loved our spouse the same way we show our love for God, we'd all be divorced. I love God. I just never talk to him. I love God. I just never go see him. I love God. I just don't do what he says. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Pretty simple. I can tell everyone that I play for the Cincinnati Bengals, but today at 1 o'clock, I won't be on the field. So I can say whatever I want to say. I can tell you I'm the best quarterback in the NFL. I'm just not on a team. And so what are we saying? We say, we say, we're saying that Peter just kind of retreated back into his old lifestyle. And he's just saying, you know what, guys? I'm just going to do what I know to do because that, I, I don't want to be challenged. You know, there's a lot of people in their spiritual life, they get about 50 years old in church, and they don't want to be challenged anymore. They don't, they, they don't want to be told to get up and move. They, they don't want to move. They just want to find a nice little resting place. But you know, here's the thing about Jesus. He loves you enough to annoy you. Some of you who have been disappointed and discouraged, and you just backed up and you went fishing again, Jesus is not going to leave you alone. Okay, uh, Trust me, he will not leave you alone. He's going to follow you. You're going to hear reminders on the radio. I'm talking to some people today that you know what I'm talking about because Jesus will not leave you alone, will he? He follows you, and every time you run into an old friend, they say, well, I'm going to church now. And you're like, everybody I meet. And you're hearing songs on the radio, and you're listening to things on the television, and you're seeing signs everywhere, and you're reading the newspaper, and all these little things are starting to come back to you. It's like, wow, my Sunday school teacher used to say, and you know that preacher used to say, what is that? It is recognizing God. So Jesus stands on the shore, kind of like that picture represents the boat was probably a little further away from shore because these guys are fishing and they've caught nothing all night long 
Jesus had done this once before in Peter's life. In the beginning of Peter's ministry, Jesus told him to put his net on the other side of the boat. and They caught a whole bunch of fish on the other side of the boat. And that was how he knew that Jesus was the Messiah because of that event. In, in, in God good, Jesus comes back and does the same thing again. And I want to tell you something about God. He is so patient. He's so loving. He'll just keep giving you the same thing. I like to tell people, you never flunk God's tests. You just keep taking them until you pass. And Jesus in his mercy comes to Peter, comes to the rest of the disciples, and here's the amazing thing. Peter says, I'm going fishing. They said, we're going with you also. I'm reading again from your notes. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. So they caught nothing all night long. Jesus says, well, I'm going to do it to them again. He says, put your net on the other side of the boat. So they put the net on the other side of the boat, and there's all the fish. They start bringing them in. It didn't take Peter long at that point in time to say, I know who that is. I recognize him. That's my Lord, and that's my Savior. And as an example that Peter was not going to settle just to fish any longer, he jumped in the water. The rest of the guys, they rowed in the boat, you know. Not Peter, he wasn't going to wait. He jumped in the water and he swam to Jesus, recognizing that, you know what, in my discouragement, in my discomfort, in my disappointment, my God loves me enough to stand on that shore and to give me another chance. And when Peter swam to shore, guess what? He smelled something. Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the risen Lord, had, while they were fishing, gathered some sticks. I don't know how he lit the fire. He may have just like, whew, called it down. I'm not sure. But he gathered some sticks. He lit a fire. He had fish cooking for breakfast. Where did he get his fish? Again, I don't know. But I can use my imagination. But the beauty of the story is not how he lit the fire and got the fish. The beauty of the story is, hey, Peter, I'm going to give you a second chance. Come on in here, son. And when Peter got to Jesus, Jesus didn't beat him up and chastise him. Jesus just said, you want some breakfast? You've been out there fishing, caught nothing. I've already got something good for you. And what he was saying to Peter was, in your discouragement and disappointment, keep going, son, because i got something better for you ahead. you got to keep going. I'm talking to some men here that God's saying to you, keep going, son. Keep going. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disappointed. Keep believing. Keep praying. Don't just retreat into the fishing boat. I'm talking to some ladies here where God is saying to you, daughter, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Just keep moving. I've got good things for you. You say, but I've turned my back on God and I've walked away from God. You know, you, you may have walked back to that fishing boat a hundred times. I promise you, he's never left you or forsaken you. He's on the shore cooking you breakfast, waiting for you to come back. I feel like today there's people who just need to come back. There's people here who need to come back. There's people here who have walked away from God, who have been disappointed, discouraged. You feel like maybe Mary at the tomb, you've, you, you, your heart's been full of grief. and maybe, maybe you've been like the guys on the road to, to Emmaus. Your life doesn't make sense and you don't know why, but God is saying, I'm in your circumstances. I'm behind you. I'm in front of you. I'm over you. I'm under you. I've never left you or forsaken you. Now I'm asking you, to just give your heart and your life back to God. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never been saved, never been born again. Maybe you've never committed your life to Jesus. This is your morning today. This is your morning. This is the time to do it. It's not, it's not even hard. It's just, it's just a, a, a point in time where you say, God, I want to surrender my life to you. I've, I've got sins. I've got junk, and I'm just going to give them all to you. And when you do that and you believe, you truly believe that Jesus loves you, and that he paid a price for those sins. God forgives every one of them. And now you're in a relationship with God you can start to build your life on. Is it going to be easy? No. During the Buckeye game, they interviewed Cornelius Green and Archie Griffin. And they asked Cornelius Green, what did you learn from Woody Hayes? And he mentioned three things. And here was the third thing. He said, this is the most important thing that Coach Hayes taught us. Anything worth having is worth fighting for. It doesn't come easy. What you're fighting for is your eternal life. What you're fighting for is the future of your children and your grandchildren. What you're fighting for is heaven. It's to live eternity with God in heaven instead of hell. You're going to live forever somewhere. What are you fighting for? You're fighting for eternity. You're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your sanity, your life from here forward. 
Is it easy? Of course not. But I can tell you that God's going to never leave you or forsake you. And you don't have to be afraid. Because man can't do anything to you, but you've got to commit your life to it. I want you to stand up. And I want to talk to people today who have been away from God. People who have been saved at one time, walked with God, had commitments to God, who had walked close to God. And you are here this morning. And I can tell you you're here because God designed for you to be here. You may say, now wait a minute, I just I saw, your, I saw, saw a, a Facebook post and I came or a friend invited me or, or whatever. You know what? You need to recognize that this is God. It's not just your friend. It's just not the Facebook. It's just not the website. It's God. It's God speaking to you. It's God drawing you. Mike, I want you to come up. Um, just take your guitar. I just want you to play your guitar and I want you to just... Uh, I don't know if there's a chorus that's it's really simple and really easy to sing. Mike, you can, you can sing that chorus. In just a minute, we take an offering at this time in our service. We have, a, we have a, actually a fellowship break where we just, you know, for 10 minutes or so, we just, we just connect with each other because we love each other. And I want, you, I want you to know, you are in the most loving church I've ever been in in my life. It's a loving church and it's a non-judgmental church. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. There'll be people here who will embrace you in the love of God. Right now, I want to give you a chance. I want to give you a chance to say, God, I'm coming home. For people who have, who have walked with God but wandered away and you went back to the fishing vessel, I want to give you a chance who have never, ever given your heart to God, never, ever really committed your life to God to say, God, today's the, the, the day of my new journey. I'm going to start a new journey today. So, Mike, I just want you to pray. I want everyone to bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to do something. And I know for people maybe that have never been here before, you, you, you think, wow, that's, that's kind of a tough thing to do. Yeah, you know, it, sometimes life is tough. Sometimes doing the right thing is tough. Yeah. But I'm going to ask anyone that has never walked with God, I'm going to ask to anyone that has walked with God at one time, but you're kind of like Peter, you went back to the boat, you're just kind of hanging out in the boat because it's comfortable for you. Maybe you come to church every Sunday, but you've got yourself so comfortable you've not even been challenged. It's time to step it up. I'm talking to some men here, it's time to step it up. I'm talking to some women here, it's time to step it up. Maybe people that have never come to God or walked away from God entirely, it's time to come home. You know what? I've done this for years and years and years and had thousands of services and I still believe the best way to make a commitment to God is publicly in front of everyone to walk down and to have a time where you pray. And while Mike plays and Mike just, Mike you can sing if you want and just worship God, I'm going to give about one or two minutes of time that if anyone wants to come down here and meet us to pray that you can come now. Someone will come with you. In fact, I would like for our elders, the, the ministry elders that come up every week, I want you to come first. I want you to come up and stand around this altar. I want the ministry elders to come up and stand around the altar. I want you to face me. I want you to face me. I want you to be the leaders of the church. I want you to come forward first. I want you to say, first and foremost, we're going to lead. God has never left me or forsaken me, and I'm going to lead. Now, if there's anybody else that wants to come and pray, now's your chance. Step out and come and join these elders that are up front now. We're going to pray together. Come on. You want to come back to God? You want to come to God for the first time? I don't know what it is. You've been playing games. Maybe you've just been laying out. You've been, been going through the motions. Time to stop. It's time to say, I'm getting serious. Come up and kneel. You can come up and stand. I don't care. It's really about the condition of your heart. And you might say to me, you say, Mark, what? I... I'm not real comfortable going up there in front of everyone. All right, I get it. I get it. I just want to make sure of this. That you've got enough strength to do it out there when people really are standing against you. Sometimes I wonder, you know, if we can't make a move in a building where everybody wants us to, how are we going to do it at school when nobody wants us to? This is an easy part right now. This is easy. It's never going to get easier to stand up for God than it is right now. It's not going to be easier in your home it's not going to be easier in your workplace. It's not going to be easier in your school. This is easy. So come on, if you need to pray. Now, I want our ministry elders just to take liberty and begin to minister to people and pray with people as you see fit and however you feel led to do that.
Come on, anyone else that wants to come and pray, you come forward now. We're going to pray together. We're going to give you every opportunity to say, God, I'm done playing games. I'm coming out of the boat. You know, Peter jumped in the water and swam to Christ. Mary embraced Christ. Mary embraced Christ so much that Jesus had to push her away and say, easy, easy. Those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus disappeared, they were so excited about what they had witnessed that they actually ran back seven miles to Jerusalem. It's okay to make your move. It's okay to say, God, I want to commit to you. I want it all. I want you to bow your heads and I'm going to pray over everyone today. We're going to give the people here just a minute to say their prayers, to have the elders pray with them. But I want to pray for you. With your heads bowed and everyone's eyes closed again, we're going to receive our offering. We're going to have our break time. We even have all of our music planned and some things that will be very good. But right now, this is the best thing that could be happening on earth. How many people would raise your hand and just say this? No one looking around. We don't want to inhibit somebody. But how many people would raise your hand? And it's not, you know, it's not me seeing you that's most important. It's you between you and God. But this is a good physical reaction to the call of God on your life. How many people would raise your hand and say, Mark, you know, pray for me because I hear the call of God. I'm like those people that I'm recognizing God in my life and I'm, I'm, I want to go further. Maybe you didn't come forward today but you want to go further, just raise your hand if you say, I'm one of the ones that God's got his hand on. Good. Good. <clears throat> There's anyone here that has never been born again or you walked away from God. At one time you used to know God and walk with God, but man, life just got a hold of you. And it's been so long since you felt that and walked in that joy. You can raise your hand and say, Mark, pray for me. I got to get back. I got to get back. Good. 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 I got to get back. It's not as far as you think. Coming back to God is not as far as you think. He's never left you or forsaken you. It's pretty easy. He's really close. And so I want to pray for you now. Ready? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you today that, Lord, you have never left or forsaken us. That, God, there's people here that if we would tell our stories, we've been in bars, we've been in wrecks, we've been in fights. We've been high, we've been stoned, we've been, we've been with people. We don't even remember who they were. And God, I know that through all of our stupidity, you have been gracious to keep us alive. God, you've saved our life more than we know. Thank you, God. You've never left us or forsaken us. God, I know there's people here and they've been through disappointment and discouragement. And they've, they've, they, they felt, they felt the heart and the, the, the heartache and the loss and the grief. Lord God, but you've never left them or forsaken. Let their heart be warmed. Let their heart be warmed. And I know today, God, there's people here that have walked with you and just been discouraged and given up and wanted to throw in the towel. And maybe some have. They've just gone back to the boat, retreated back to their comfort zone. God, let them know 
You got breakfast for them on the shore. Lord God, I pray for us that we will be enthused about our walk with you, that we will be excited, we will be passionate, and we will prioritize you. We won't just talk that we love you. We will show you that we love you by our obedience. God, I pray that you would light people on fire. Let us have a fire and a passion for you that burns in our hearts, that burns in our souls, that burns in our minds, that burns in our marriages and our families, that we would, we would shove away the world's priorities for our life and we would replace it with your word and what you said was important. And God, I pray you would shake us to our bones, if need be, to let us wake up and see that the most important thing about all eternity is that we get right with you. And today, God, we do that. Today we do it. As a congregation, as individuals, today we do it. In Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. Amen. I want you to clap your hands and worship God and give Him praise like we did at the beginning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.